Hello brothers and sisters, may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all on this amazing and wonderful day of our Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, so today I just want to share a very basic uh, message with everyone. Um, I've wanted to share a gospel message on here for those who are seeking the Lord, for those who don't know the Lord. Um, and just to really help guide and convict and show you what the scripture actually says about all these things even for those of us who are believers um, i pray that today we'll have some uh, insight for those who are not reading their bibles for those who are not spending their time in the word and i pray that it be a wake-up call um, in meekness and in love um, but a wake-up call nonetheless to those who are just living in sin and thinking, you know, once saved, always saved, hyper-grace, you know, nonsense, really. So, I've entitled this video, Basics, Who Will and Who Will Not Enter Into the Kingdom? Okay, so, I'm going to quickly go to... 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9 okay now these are scriptures that are very regularly quoted and, and referenced by many men of God and with good reason it's uh, it's for convicting people you see what we need to understand is this God is righteous he's perfect he's holy He's just, you know, just like, uh, well, well, let's take an extreme example, uh, quite shockingly, actually. Many people these, da these days don't know who Hitler was. Um, however, we'll use the example of Hitler. If you don't know who he was, go and do a little bit of research. Um, if Hitler had to stand before a judge in court, it would be fair to say that that judge should judge him righteously and send him to prison or whatever the appropriate punishment would be whether corporal punishment or life sentence multiple life sentence whatever the case may be but you would expect the judge to convict him of his of breaking the law of all the multiple counts of felonies he committed and atrocities that he committed murder and or well not just murder but genocide mass genocide so we would expect the judge to be just now God is like that God is a just judge and that is how he is revealed in the Old Testament of the Bible before we are before he is revealed to us as our father in the New Testament so in the Old Testament we see the character of God as being righteous and just and perfect and if you are not just and perfect as he is just and perfect and you do not obey him, then you will suffer his wrath um, and his judgment. Even though that's not what he wants, it's not in his heart to do that, but he is perfectly righteous, so he must. Um, Jesus came to reveal the Father. He came to reveal God as the Father because God is our Father and he loves us so dearly. And... It's like a parent disciplining their child. You know, you don't, your dad's not just going to beat you because you were walking around. He's going to beat you or give you a hiding or reprimand you or discipline you in whatever way is necessary based on your actions if you have done something wrong. And it's important that the parent both correct discipline, whether verbally or uh, physically, but then also support that with a reason as to why. Because if we don't discipline, we only love, we spoil. But if we discipline and we don't love or we don't explain why the discipline has come, the child can experience it as abuse. So God has to be both just, perfectly just and righteous. He has to discipline and he has to love. And that's what he does. He's both together. So it's like a good parent. 
that's going to raise a good child. That is where the model comes from. We are created in God's image, right? Okay, so understanding that if you stand in front of a judge in the court and he's got a law and his law has 10 laws in it, or not his law, but you know the law of the state or the nation, and you've broken one of those laws, he's going to judge you and you're going to say, hey, you know, but I'm a good person. I've taken care of the poor and, you know, those who didn't have a home, I took them into my house and those who were hungry, I fed. And the judge is going to say, that's really great. And I'm glad that you did that, but you're guilty and I have to send you to prison. So we need to understand that about God. And we need to understand that all fall short of the grace of God. And that's why we need Jesus Christ. So I'm quickly going to read in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, starting in verse 9, it says, <clears throat> Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, so let's just assess that for a moment. Let's go through it quickly. Let's go through here again. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So don't you know that those who are unrighteous, walking contrary to God, will not inherit the kingdom of God. He wants you to, but if you're in opposition to him, then you cannot. It's impossible because you're walking in unrighteousness. Don't be deceived. Don't let your churches and people in the world, other Christians who are off the path, whether even pastors, you know, even your pastors, the people leading churches, anybody can be deceived, guys. Anybody can be deceived. Don't let any man deceive you or spoil you. The truth is in the Bible. It's in the Word. Okay? So be not deceived. Neither fornicators, those of you, those of us, who, because I'm guilty of this, I was guilty of this as well. Neither fornicators, so fornicators are people who are sleeping with others outside of wedlock, outside of marriage. Nor idolaters, anybody who is worshipping false idols. And idolaters doesn't just mean false idols. It means that you are giving more time to something else than you are giving to God. So gaming could be your idol. Um, you know, sport could be your idol. Entertainment could be your idol. Your child could be your idol. There's just, there's so many different things. Any pleasure in life can be an idol if it consumes more of your time than the time that you give to God on a daily basis. Okay, so neither fornicators nor idolaters, nor adulterers. That's self-explanatory. However, Jesus does say, he who looks at a woman with lust has committed adultery, adultery with her in his heart already. And the equivalent for woman to men nor effeminate so a man who is effeminate and very feminine nor abusers of themselves with mankind abusers of themselves with mankind are um, it, it's referring to sodomites and sodomy is not just um, it's not just male and male and it's not just female and female it's not just of the homosexual variety it's anything that is against the natural purposes it could be husband and wife doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Um, that would also be classified as abusers of themselves with mankind. All sorts of, we won't go into that because of the viewers and uh, there might be young viewers here, but I'm sure you understand the meaning. Um, nor thieves, okay, so thief will not enter, nor covetous, if you jealous, and you covet after what somebody else wants. Somebody else has a nicer car than you and you're jealous of them. Somebody else has a more beautiful wife than you do and you're jealous of them. Somebody else has, you know, I don't know, more money than you do. And you're jealous of them. Somebody has a better relationship with God than you do and you're jealous of them. You wish you had that. Don't do that. That's, that's coveting. 
That's one of the basic Ten Commandments. Okay. Nor drunkards. Now, this is a big one. I mean, the effeminate and the abusers of mankind, which is essentially directed at homosexuality. Um, and again, let me just say this. It's not that God... God does not... He loves you. He loves the sinner. He wants you. He wants you to come and become his child. He wants you to be reconciled unto him. But these things are what separate you. He loves you, but he hates your sin. So you need to decide. Do you want to hold on to your sin and perish? Or do you want to let go of your sin and live? And God will show you the life that he intended for you. You've got to make that decision. So this one's a big one. Nor drunkards. So if you are somebody who abuses yourself with alcohol, being drunk, even just once is, you know, once unrepentant is enough. Once unrepentant of any of these things is enough. We need to repent. Repentance does not happen once and then it's over. If you fall into sin, your repentance was only up until the time where you repented and now you've continued and you've sinned again and you've fallen. You have to repent of that sin. Otherwise, that sin will be counted against you. Okay, so nor drunkards. There's a lot of a lot of my friends that fall into that category. A lot of my friends fall into the category of fornication, idolaters, um, adulterers, definitely. Um, some abusers of mankind. Some thieves. Some many covetous, and almost all drunkards. Then it says nor revilers nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now, the next verse is what we need to hear. This is the beautiful part here. And Paul continues as he's speaking or writing to the Corinthians. And he says, And such were some of you. We were all like that. And such were some of you. But you were all washed. But ye were washed. But ye are sanctified. But ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Hallelujah. Amen. So, it's saying, just like me, you know, before I knew Jesus, I was pretty much most things on that list most things on that list and I was headed I had a one-way ticket straight to hell I didn't think I was a bad person I thought I was a pretty decent guy and it was only once God convicted my conscience of all this evil that I was doing because lying is evil to God abusing yourself with alcohol is evil to God abusing yourself with mankind is evil to God Looking at a woman with lust is evil to God. And we need only commit that evil once outside of Jesus. So if we never accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, breaking one of those commandments, rebelling against God in one aspect, once is enough to send you to his prison, which is the lake of fire for all eternity. But he's so gracious that he said, in John chapter 3, verse 16, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. So, and such were some of you, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So turn from your wicked ways, turn from your sin. These are the people who will not inherit the kingdom of God. But those who accept Jesus, they call out to Jesus with a true heart, knowing that they cannot make it of their own. There's no ways. It's like trying to, you know, I don't know, jump out the window and think you're going to survive. You're not. You're not. You have to have a, a safety net down there. 
You have to have a savior down there. And Jesus is that safety net. Jesus is that savior. Because we're all jumping. All of us. Don't make any mistake about that. We're all jumping. We're already falling. We're already in free fall. But we need a savior. You know, like the stunt doubles have those big blow-up mattresses. Or not mattresses, but inflatable like a jumping castle. Matt. Yeah. So that's the one section I wanted to look at. So please, guys, if you are in this list, don't remain on that list. Seek the Lord. Turn away from your sin. Turn away from the things that God says. These will not inherit the kingdom of God. Not these may not, not these might not. These will not inherit the kingdom of God. And I pray that that next verse, verse 11, is the one that is relevant to you. And such were some of you. I praise God. I thank God that I am no longer as such. And I pray that you aren't either. Okay, so let's move on. Next one is in Galatians chapter 5. I think we're starting in verse 17. Let me quickly get to Galatians. Galatians. Okay, Galatians. Galatians chapter 5. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to start in verse 16 actually. Okay, so it says, This I say then, Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Okay? Had a young man asking my sister the other day why she believes in Jesus, and how does she know that there's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and just really arguing with her about everything. And we know that this is spiritual. It's not, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, right? But against um, spiritual wickedness in high places and all that. So this is really an answer to that the flesh is your will the spirit is submission to god's will okay so this i say then walk in the spirit that means on a daily basis submit yourself to god first thing in the morning say lord like it says in romans 12 verse 1 it says present yourselves a living your body a living sacrifice right holy and what does it say holy and acceptable unto the lord for that is our reasonable service we should present ourselves a living sacrifice every day unto the lord for that is our minimum or our reasonable service to god and that is how we walk in the spirit so it says this i say then walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh for the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh so you see, it's kind of like fire and water. Fire and water cannot mix. They cannot come together. They cannot become a mixture. It's impossible because they are contrary one to the other. Um, and this is why people think they can straddle. They think they can live in their sin and they think that they can serve God. And this is just not true. It is just completely unbiblical. It's completely, completely a lie from hell, from the pit of hell. Because flesh lusteth against the spirit, and spirit against the flesh. So if you are in your flesh, you are not in your spirit. And if you are in your spirit, you are not in your flesh. You cannot straddle. All right? I hope that clears that up for some people, because I know that can be quite a big issue. And these are contrary one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. So, we know that the will of the flesh is contrary to God. It's rebellious towards God. It's to walk in the lusts of our flesh, to do the things that please us, that we desire. And our pleasures usually are against the will of God in almost every circumstance. So it says, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. So you can't do the things that you want to do or that you would do, but rather that by submitting to God, he keeps you from those things. In the Lord's Prayer, we say, Lord, lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil well the only way that that's possible is if we first make the choice to submit to God and walk in the spirit rather than the flesh <coughs> excuse me <clears throat> but if ye be led by the spirit ye are not under the law 
So if you are led by the Spirit, then you're not under the law. And a lot of people have difficulty understanding this. We are not meant to be keeping the Old Testament law. However, it doesn't mean that the law is not kept. The law is kept. But it's kept divinely through the Holy Spirit that indwells us as born-again believers. If you are not a born-again believer, this is going to be a completely foreign concept to you. And you're going to try, you're going to struggle to understand this with your carnal mind. But once you've received the Spirit of God by submission to Jesus Christ, professing Him and trusting alone in Him, and being baptized in the Holy Spirit and in water, then you will know what I'm talking about here and what Paul is talking about to the Corinthians. Okay, <clears throat> But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So the law is kept by the Spirit inside of us because it is God Himself. Is so then the Scripture goes into, what are we now? Verse 19. And now it's going to show you the separation between the works, it says, of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit which we see later in verse 22 and following. Okay, so verse 19. Now the works of the flesh. Now remember, flesh and spirit are contrary one to the other. Fire and water can't mix, you can't straddle. Opposites. Okay. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, I'll put a list up. I'll just take a photo of my beautiful young sister. Bless her soul. Um, she made an awesome little uh, list. I'm going to see if it's clear and visible, and I'll post it up on the screen. Okay, then we go. So that, that's now the works of the flesh. So we know that... By the works of the flesh, there is no ways that we can enter into the kingdom of God. We cannot inherit the kingdom of God, is what it says here in verse 21. Going into verse 22, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit, okay, so now we've seen the works of the flesh, now we're looking at the fruit of the Spirit. So when we walk in Spirit, this is basically what you will see and what you will experience and what you will have as the fruit in your life. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, which is patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So in verse 17, we see that the flesh and the Spirit lust one against each other. They are fighting there at loggerheads with one another, right? And then it's explained. The works of the flesh are all these bad things, you know. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. So against the one, which is the flesh, there is a law. So the law of the Old Testament, if you live in your flesh, applies to you. And you have to live and keep the whole law all of the time. Otherwise, you will go to hell. This is for everybody. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian, a Buddhist, a Taoist, a Hindu. It doesn't matter. You have to keep the whole law all of the time if you are after the flesh. And if you are after the spirit, then you are under grace. Then the law of the Old Testament no longer applies to you. Because you will be led from the inside by the Spirit of God. And the nature and the will of God is manifest in you. And you will see the fruits of the Spirit and you will walk in such things as love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. 
These will be the things that people will see inside of you as fruits in your life. And this is how when somebody is transformed by the power of God, by believing in Jesus Christ, by confessing him as Lord and Savior and the only begotten Son of God, the Father, you start to see these changes happening in their lives. And all these things in verses 19 and 20 and 21 slowly start to fade away and are replaced with what we see in verse 20 and 23, which are the fruits of the Spirit. So the works of the flesh become less and less and less, and the fruit of the Spirit becomes more and more and more. And eventually, you look at that same person, they have the same face, but their actions are completely different. Their heart has been transformed by God. So, who will enter into the kingdom of God? Those who walk after the Spirit. Those are the ones who will enter. Who will not enter into the kingdom of God? Those who walk after the flesh. I'll take you to one more place very quickly. John chapter 3. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit just brought it to my remembrance as well. When talking about the kingdom, this was actually not on the list to share, but I'm going to share it quickly. Okay, so I'm just going to read, and we'll read through to verse 5, from verse 1. Okay, so John chapter 3, John, the gospel according to John. Chapter 3, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. I just quickly want to say here on this note, a ruler of the Jews, the Jews of the cultivated olive tree, which means that from birth they are raised to know the one true living God. They are cultivated from the day they're born. They are circumcised on the eighth day and are raised with the scriptures okay, of the Old Testament. So when you're a leader of the Jews, you are somebody who knows. You, you're basically like a theologian, you know, um, or at the very least like a pastor today. That's the kind of knowledge you have of the scriptures, okay, because you have to. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Okay, So except he is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Okay, so I want to quickly cover that. When we're born again, how are we born again? We are born again when we confess the Lord with our mouth and with a pure heart in truth. Okay? Knowing that He is the only begotten Son of the Father, that He came and died for our sins because we need a Savior. He took the sin of every single human being on the planet upon Himself as God poured out His wrath, died on the cross for us, rose again bodily the third day, and ascended to sit on the right hand of God, and that He will return in all His glory for His children, for His people, for His bride, for the body of Christ as He is the head. Okay? So to be born again means to believe that, to believe in Jesus Christ and confess that. Okay? <clears throat> So, when you're born again, you can see the kingdom of God. It doesn't mean you've entered yet, but you can see it, okay? Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom. Uh, of God okay that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit okay so we have to be Jesus himself was baptized and he is the way the truth and the life he was baptized by immersion not by sprinkling okay now some people think they can improve on the ministry of Jesus I don't believe that I believe that Jesus was fully man and fully God, and that he is perfect. 
He was sinless. He was perfect on earth. And uh, I'll follow him. <laughs> he is the way. He was baptized. That's good enough for me. I'll be baptized in the water. Here he says it to a leader of the Jews who doesn't know these things. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to share that with you. So to be born again, when you confess Jesus with your mouth, you will be able to see the kingdom of God. But only when you are born of spirit and of water, meaning you've had your water baptism for repentance and your spiritual baptism in, into the, that the Holy Spirit may enter into you, your Holy Spirit baptism, then will you be able to enter into the kingdom of God. I pray this has been a blessing to you all. And um, yeah, there's a lot more to share. I'm going to try and do a series. We'll see, see about that a little series on understanding the Bible. I'll take you guys through a little breakdown and uh, try to show you the foundational building blocks that lead to true and false doctrine. Okay, to help you discern better what's actually going on. So uh, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And I just want to close in a prayer quickly. Oh, Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, and we just give you thanks for this amazing day, Lord. We give you thanks for, for blessing this video, Lord, for speaking through my mouth as I submitted myself to you, Lord, as I do daily. Lord, and uh, I just pray that you will touch the hearts of everybody watching this video, Lord. Believe or unbeliever, Lord, just touch their hearts. We know that you can save to the uttermost. And Lord, even those of us who are truly, uh, have truly entered into the kingdom, Lord, and have seen the kingdom, Lord, let us not fall away, Lord. We know that you don't want to see us in grade one, achieving 100% every year, but still in grade one, and then 100% the next year, grade one, and 100% the next year. Lord, we know that you want to see us grow. You don't care if we get 60% or 70% or 50% as long as we're going from grade 1 to grade 2 to grade 3 to grade 4 So Lord, I just pray that this message is helping my brothers and sisters your children Lord and those lost sheep who you are calling home Those who are to be called the sons and daughters of God Lord That it is just a blessing to them and that through me Lord you have reached them this day Lord, I thank you for all that you do the small and the great the seen and the unseen and Lord, I love you with all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my mind, and with all of my strength, Lord. Let us all run for you. Not sit, stand, or walk, but run for you, Lord. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Holy Spirit. We pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Lord. God bless you guys. See you next time. Bye.